Uh, welcome back to many of you. I know that uh, you've been with us for this nine part series. I don't know what you're gonna do with your Thursday afternoons at two o'clock anymore, but uh, we're thrilled to have you here. Uh, for those of you that I haven't met uh, via email, I've talked to many of you via email. I'm Jody Waterhouse and I'm with the CU Anschutz Multidisciplinary Center on Aging. And certainly on behalf of myself and uh, my co-partner, uh, Sarah Qualls from the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs Aging Center, uh, we'd very much like to welcome you today to our last of the webinar series. It's hard to imagine we've already um, had nine, almost nine presentations uh, in the emotional and mental health and older adults uh, series. So again, a huge thank you to all of you. If this is your first time, welcome. And if you've come back uh, after multiple webinars, we hope to see you again uh, in the near, near future. So just a couple housekeeping items. I um, want you to be aware that if you did uh, miss some of the webinars at the beginning of the session, they are all posted up on our YouTube channel. And I'll make sure to include that link uh, on the uh, final evaluation email that you'll receive from me after today's presentation. So make sure that you go to the YouTube channel and, and catch up, if, even if you were at some of the sessions and wanna brush up on some of the strategies and resources that our presenters have shared, um, feel free to visit those at any time. Those are available to all of you. I'd also like to um, just let you know that we are working on a part two, uh, a second series. This has been so well received and we have received such great feedback from all of you that um, we will uh, make sure to have a second series under the emotional and mental health in, in older adults um, umbrella. So watch for that. We are really hoping that we can turn this around and do another um, six to eight part series, probably the middle to end of March. So watch for your emails, make sure you're getting emails from me so that you get that announcement. I'd also like to just remind you of a program that I mentioned last week that we have here at CU Anschutz, and that is our COSTED program. And that is connecting older adults and students through interprofessional telecare. And we are looking for older adults to become phone buddies with our CU Anschutz pharmacy, dental medicine, and nursing students. Um, you, by becoming a phone buddy, you help our students learn how to better communicate and work with older adults. And since that will be the majority of their patient population, unless of course they're going into pediatrics, we want to make sure that they are well-versed in how to work better with older adults. So if you are interested in that program, I will also have that information in the evaluation email following today's presentation. I'd also like to thank our community partners, Denver Public Library, <clears throat> excuse me, and Broomfield Senior Services. And don't forget that throughout the presentation, put your questions into the chat box. We will be monitoring the chat room and then that way um, we'll have time to um, dialogue with Dr. Sussman after her presentation today. So make sure you're putting those in throughout the presentation and that way you don't have to try and remember your question um, at the very end and we'll make sure she answers that. So it is my pleasure to welcome our speaker today. Dr. Jolene Sussman is a board certified Giro psychologist and an assistant professor at the University of Colorado. She completed her graduate work at the University of Iowa and her postgraduate psychology fellowship at the Zablocki VA in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin back in 2013. And for those of you that were on the presentation last week, uh, Dr. Donaldson was reporting live from uh, Zablocki uh, VA in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So um, two people with a connection to that VA. She currently works at the Eastern Colorado Health VA care system here in Denver. And she works in geriatric primary cl care clinic dementia care outpatient team, and the Grec Connect telehealth team. Her clinical work consists of conducting neuropsychological assessments, psychotherapy, and caregiver education support. Her research is focused on dementia care programs. So with that, please help me welcome Dr. Jolene Sussman. Thank you, Jody. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. I'm very excited to wrap up this series and have a, a great talk ready for you. 
Today we'll be talking about living well with neurocognitive disorder, also known as known as dementia. Um, I hope for some of you, you thought, what a funny title to a talk. How do you live well with such an awful disease? Um, let's see if by the end of this time together, I can convince you that there are opportunities to live well with such an awful disease. So that's my goal for today. Uh, Jody already did a nice introduction for me. Um, I'm a geropsychologist, which means I have spent some time focused in psychology on the aging person and really have honed in on the aging brain and helping families and caregivers understand what's going on with their loved ones. So the starting point of the talk today to get everyone's mind in the same place is at the point that someone, either yourself or someone else in your life is told by a medical provider, I'm so sorry, but you or your loved one have dementia. So that's where we're gonna jump in. What now? Um, sometimes it can feel like we're abandoned at this point. It can feel like you don't know where to go. Uh, last week we heard there's no manual that comes with our brain. Well, there sure isn't a manual that comes with dementia either. So we're going to talk through what the next steps might be or some options. We're going to discuss the different stages of dementia because that's how I've kind of formatted out this talk. We're going to focus, focus on living well at each stage. And this is going to have parts both for the person with dementia and the person's loved one or caregivers. So I pulled this graphic from the Alzheimer's Association. I did not make this beautiful graphic, though I think it will be helpful today on where we're focused. And when, just a reminder, dementia is this big umbrella term. Alzheimer's is one type of dementia, but this graph nicely goes across that big umbrella of all different types of dementia. So what is dementia? A couple weeks ago, we heard about the, what dementia is. Just a reminder, a dementia is a change in cognition on objective testing plus a change in functional decline. So that functional decline moves us into the purple part of this graph. So we're not going to be talking about preclinical AD is Alzheimer's disease, but we can think dementia. We're not going to talk about mild cognitive impairment today. We're going to move right in this purple of mild dementia, moderate dementia, and severe dementia. Oh, just a reminder, as questions come up, I told Jody to watch the chat and that she can interrupt me. Um, sometimes the questions are easier to answer live as I'm going through things and this talk builds on itself. So please write in some questions as they come up for you and I'll try to address them as we go. I uh, do not mind being interrupted at all. Okay. So for this, we're gonna see this graph at the top of every slide now. For the preclinical dementia and mild cognitive impairment means changes in cognition without functional impairment, those were already addressed. So those of you who tuned in, tuned in last week learned all about dancers. So recalling Dr. Donaldson's lecture last week, those are the areas to work on when you're in those stages or have loved one in those stages. If you miss this talk, contact Jody Waterhouse and she will forward the handouts to you, the person who is just speaking, okay? So let's get into the part that I'm going to be helpful with today, and we're going to start here at mild dementia. So this is where symptoms, usually where diagnosis happens, and the symptoms, the, you have changes in cognition, you're not cognitively as good as you used to be, and they're starting to make it harder to get through everyday life. So the starting point for this is once you hear from the doctor, or your loved one hears from the doctor, you have dementia, the first question should be, how do I get education about this? And there's different ways to go about this. In some hospital systems, you can ask for a referral and you can get to a program that might be able to provide education, either through a caregiver support program or other specialists in the hospital. I'm working in the VA. I can speak to those of you who have veterans in your life or are a veteran. We definitely have this as an opportunity. And then in the community, it's more based on each hospital. Though we do have an Alzheimer's Association that you've already heard about through these talks, and I have a handout that's attached to this invite that you can get the, the live link here that I've linked us to, the Colorado Chapter Alzheimer's Association. They have just a wealth of information about all types of dementia, not just Alzheimer's, caregiver classes, groups, education, everything you could want in a one-stop shop there. So I, that's a, a great place to start. 
And then there, you know, I, I mentioned there's a lot of different types of dementia, one of them being Parkinson's dementia or Lewy body's dementia. And there are specific support groups here in Colorado for folks that are experiencing different types of dementia than Alzheimer's. So I put a couple links in as well. They're in that handout and they will take you to a website. Um, probably the most known and, and go-to book that you've already heard about in other talks, but I'll say it again, is The 36-Hour Day. This book is the idea that when you're a caregiver of someone with dementia, it can feel like a 24-hour day is much longer. Um, so it, it really is written for caregivers of dementia, but I also have had people who have dementia earlier and are early in the diagnosis pick up this book and read about it for folks who want to know more about what's going to happen, what's going on with my brain. So that can be a, a resource both ways. Um, that book is available at most libraries on audiobook or in large print, or very cheap to buy at a bookstore or online. So the first part is how do you get the education? And these are a couple of ideas of how to do that. I would not recommend Googling it. You'll get a lot of misinformation. And I bet some people have some bad or some kind of sad stories to share there with Googling this type of stuff. This is now, now the part of living well. So what do you do here? You have this really awful diagnosis. There's a grim outlook. So what are some things to live well with dementia at this stage? And I think that the part where I really try to push people towards is this idea of leaving a legacy. And this is for the person with dementia. So thinking about, okay, I, I hear that my cognition is going to get worse. It's gonna be harder for me to communicate. It's gonna be harder for me to share who I was as a person, the legacy of my family. So different people, depending on strengths and, and what they like of figuring out how can I leave this legacy within the people I care about. So is that either journaling, creating gifts for families, because people talk about creating cookbooks, photo books, um, I work, since I work with veterans, I work with a lot of men and they talk about creating things with their hands and so maybe metalworking or birdhouses. And of course, all of this, when we're talking about using our hands more and, and power tools, we'd want this under the supervision where it's still safe. Um, writing letters to family. To, um, and I've, I've seen this most where people wanna write to grandchildren or younger, younger family members to let them know about some of their history and some parts of their life and family heritage. Now that it's so easy to take videos, a lot of people are choosing, you even can just use a, a regular smartphone to set up to have a video of reading children's books um, that can be passed on through the generations or videos of discussing family traditions and legacies that can be passed on through the, through the different layers of family. This is just, these five bullet points are not supposed to be in, all inclusive, but just some ideas of how, how to leave this legacy and how to have some meaning at this part of really feeling like I'm contributing while I have this disease, not letting the disease stop you. Now on the other side, uh, getting down to business, there's also some things to take care of here that will set up you well for the next parts of dementia, the further stages. Uh, the evidence-based treatment for dementia is caregiver education and support. And then when you really look at the key components of that, it's planning for the future. So we tend to see people who do the best with dementia when they're caregivers and loved ones know what to expect and then crises don't come up because they're ready for it and it's not out of the blue and they have figured out a plan already to manage it. So then thinking of what, what type of things to be thinking about, advanced directives, um, having the person with dementia while they still have the capacity and the ability to reason through these pieces, fill out what they want for their medical care, who they want is their medical power of attorneys to help manage their medical care if they can no longer do that further down the disease. They live out this disease, they will lose the ability to be able to direct their own medical care. Similarly with financial power of attorneys, who do they want to help with finances once they're no longer able to do this? Um, who do they want the banks to be able to turn to and to make sure that they don't get scammed or exploited and that their bills still get paid? The second part, the kind of this financial management and a bigger part outside of a financial POA or power of attorney, um, just thinking in general about, okay, so, so I have this disease of dementia. How much, how much am I integrated right now into managing 
whoever with whoever's in my family, our financial future, what we're doing currently with bigger picture investments or retirement or taxes or property management. So having those discussions of starting to whoever is in charge of that, if it happens to be the person with dementia, to start ha figuring out who do I need to involve in these conversations? How do I want to delegate this when I no longer can do this anymore? Um, the Alzheimer's Association has some great classes they offer on financial planning as well and bringing up really good things to be thinking about. The next one's really hard, driving retirement. We know that if someone's going to live out the disease of dementia and die from dementia, they are going to outlive their abilities to drive safely at some point in this disease. So they will need to retire from driving. It is impossible, near impossible, to tell someone when that is going to be. There's a lot of different factors that correlate with unsafe driving, but we don't have a blood test or a way to say on this date you'll have to retire. So what we can do is more of find, you know, talk to families about what type of things that you might be anticipating and watching for. And really my role is I try to help families know what I'm telling you all right now, you're gonna have to retire from driving. So when that happens, are you set up in a place, do you live somewhere where that will be easy? Do you have somewhere, do you have someone in your life that's gonna be able to provide transportation for you? What will that look like? And it, a lot of people when I meet them with dementia are already in a phase where they're thinking about moving. And if that's at all on the docket to think about if you're moving, that place should be somewhere where you're thinking about not driving. Are you located close by or have transportation to where you're moving to the things that are important? If that's a religious place, if that's a bookstore, a grocery store, on and on. So uh, we know the people who retire from driving that do the best are those that plan for it beforehand and it was not revoked by the police by being pulled over or by healthcare providers saying you need to stop driving, but on their own will because they and family were ready for and watching for signs. Similarly, and probably less spoken about is firearm retirement. This is such a hot topic and taboo topic to talk about firearms. First, I'll say it is completely legal in the state of Colorado and most states around the country to own firearms with severe dementia. There's no laws against having them. That is different though than the safety of having firearms when our brain is no longer working. We cannot process the world as quickly. Sometimes we cannot understand visually the world as well and we're forgetful and might think someone is someone else. So for all these reasons, we recommend that there's a plan that families start planning when firearms are no longer safe, what do you want to do with those? So it's not left up to the spouse or your kids to figure that out when often those folks are not as fluent in firearms. And then the last, last piece that's really hard and we recommend having conversations with family and friends is discussions about where and how you'd like to receive assistance as you get worse and you need more help day to day. Maybe that will be the person you're living with and they can help you till the end of your disease. Maybe it won't. Maybe you'll need to hire people to come in. Maybe you'd prefer to live somewhere else where you can be helped. Having these tough conversations up front and telling family what you want will really help as the disease goes on so family knows what to do and they have less guilt and less conflict among each other when they're not sure and everyone has a different opinion of what mom or dad wanted. Okay, the third thing here in this stage for the person with dementia is to continue to take care of yourself. Sometimes it can feel like giving up. Well, I've already got dementia, so what's the point? But we do know even when we have cognitive impairment and it's starting to affect our ability to take care of our daily activities, it can... Oh, Patricia, could you mute your mic? Um, it could, so we already know that when when you have a hard time, sorry, I'm gonna rephrase that. When we, when we have dementia, we can feel like we don't really have to do those things anymore that we've talked about last week with dancers, but we do know it will be helpful to keep, if you'd like to slow the decline of the disease, it's still recommended to move our body, to get that blood flow to our brain, and to continue to eat a heart healthy diet, which you all talked about extensively last week, to manage vascular risk factors as indicated by primary care providers and doctors, specialists, to continue to socialize, to keep using our language. Language is like a muscle. 
if we stop using it and start isolating, it will be harder to keep that muscle, to keep our language. We, with dementia, our language will eventually become very hard to speak and to understand. So we should keep socializing to keep that muscle strong. Um, continue to engage in enjoyable activities that are somewhat challenging. Um, the same idea that it doesn't have to be a crossword, it's whatever you enjoy and works to your brain. Um, and the last piece that I think is missed so much because there's just so much information that comes at us at this stage of dementia about safety and planning and everything I've talked about so far is, remember, you still want to have a quality of life. So yeah, eat a heart healthy diet, but still have some donuts if that's what you like. And still, still enjoy, maybe one day you're going to sit and watch four hours of TV. That's okay. Still enjoy yourself and do the things that have always made you happy. If you're someone who enjoyed a brandy in the evening, but you know alcohol is going to make your brain worse, maybe that one brandy isn't the worst thing every once in a while. Um, that's I really try to focus on that because I think that can get lost in all this other stuff about what to do to keep your brain strong, what to do to keep going. So remembering, but life matters too. Why keep living if it's no fun? Okay, you can see my blue arrow now has moved over. We're going to move out of mild dementia into moderate dementia. So now this stage is where symptoms have started to make it harder to, to do what we call instrumental activities of daily living. We can no longer manage our finances. Driving has become really hard. We cannot manage our medications. So we're getting more assistance now. Um, and this stage really is where I turn more to loved ones, the folks that are in the person with dementia's life, their, their closest caregivers. Um, I'll even, to be as transparent as possible, I struggle when I say caregivers is we in healthcare call folks caregivers, but I know that you don't call yourself a caregiver. You're a wife or you're a son or a daughter or a brother or a husband. So that's our term, the, our best way to categorize this, but you're the person taking care of them. Um, so this is, this is where really working with loved ones and caregivers to change the idea of a difficult behavior, those challenging behaviors, to reframe that as a need that we're not meeting. So when the person with dementia is doing something like wandering or yelling or cussing, um, putting the, you know, asking where so-and-so is who's been deceased for a while, that instead of trying to address that behavior and make it stop to think, I wonder why they're doing this. What are they lonely? Are they bored? What, you know, do they need more physical exercise? Um, at this stage, we, there's often changes in most types of dementia. There's changes in what we call executive functions. Um, and this is the front part of the brain that develops last in our brain, um, right up here. And it's a hidden part that changes. So. We all know with most dementias that we're more forgetful. What is not so apparent is that it's also very hard. This part of the brain controls our ability to reason, to make decisions, to plan, to organize. And that reasoning being the key things, it's very hard because this is the part where caregivers and loved ones have to shift how they communicate. If I as a caregiver continue to reason with someone with dementia, there will be more arguing and more conflict. If you don't use your walker, then you're going to fall, then you're going to break your hip, and then we're going to go to the hospital. And the person with dementia, that's too much to hold in their brain, so they just get upset usually. Or if someone with dementia is saying, you know, where's my brother Mike? When is he coming by? But Mike has been deceased. If I were to say, don't you remember Mike died two years ago? Da, 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 da. And then that person says, no, he didn't. And then you start arguing back and forth. So instead of doing that, to just join the person with dementia's reality. Mike will be back soon. Here's your walker. Um, they say something like, Pelosi's the president. You can just say, okay, sounds good. Or if they said today, I need to get my tank top out because it's 90 degrees. Well, if you know they're not gonna go outside in a 90 degree weather with a tank top on, okay, sounds good. The other part is working with caregivers about this idea of receptive language and expressive language. It's usually pretty easy to tell with expressive language that someone can't speak as well when they're having a hard time getting words out and they can't quite get that sentence finished. And then for a caregiver to have patience. What's harder to tell and again, more hidden is usually at the same time, someone's also having a harder time understanding language. Meaning their ears can hear what you're saying, but their brain can't quite make sense of it. 
because our ears only do the hearing. Our brain tells us what someone's saying. A great example is if you do not speak Japanese, it'd almost be like you could hear this talk if I was speaking in Japanese, but your brain would have no idea what I'm trying to say. So this is a part of the disease where helping caregivers and loved ones make their language simpler, more patience, like they start using simpler language, less information at a time, simple sentences, having patience when someone can't express themselves. And then this, this last point, the visual spatial changes that happen along the way and at different time points for different types of dementia, though for all types of dementia, eventually it will get harder just like the ears, the eyes see information, but our brain is what perceives it. So the brain actually makes sense of it up here and that part of the brain starts to die off. So I could be looking straight forward at the salt and pepper shaker on the table and my loved one could say, could you grab the salt shaker? And I would act like I, I would look and say, I don't see it or I would not be able to grab it or I'd grab the pepper shaker. Not because I'm not trying or I want to upset my loved one because my brain's not perceiving it. And I don't actually perceive it in my environment. This one is really hard to get our mind around when we're caring for someone with dementia. For all of this, that's why I have this picture here. Um, dementia is, feels harder to understand because we can't see in someone's brain. The easiest way to explain this to someone or loved ones is that their brain is shrinking. In all types of dementia, the brain is dying off. So this side on the left here is a normal brain. If you were to cut my head straight open here and look in, and then this is just someone's brain with Alzheimer's type dementia. Those, those are the most generic pictures you can get, but to say they can't do all these things I just talked about because their brain is shrinking, not because they're not trying. Okay. So continuing on with this part in the moderate stage, we're having a harder time taking care of those daily activities. This is where loved ones, caregivers, are usually starting to ensure safety and quality of life, where loved ones have to start taking part in driving, taking over the driving or getting driving for someone, helping manage medications, putting them in a pillbox or handing them to the person, attending medical visits, which boy, is that hard during a time of COVID, right? Um, making sure they're taking notes during medical visits. So this is that advanced directive or power of attorney that was filled out, really now starting to enact those people joining with visits so they know what's going on. Starting to assess our firearms still safe if the person has firearms. And this, this part rings up role transitions within families. No matter what family I'm working with, there's always a transition. When someone in the family gets dementia, they've always had a role in the family and whatever that role is, now someone needs to replace it. And that can be really hard. All this education, all this stuff we've talked about, people can understand, loved ones and caregivers, but aren't able to implement because of things as, well, I'm not gonna be able to tell dad what to do because that's not the role. Dad tells me what to do. Or this is, or for a spouse that says, well, my spouse with dementia always took care of the finances and the driving and I've been the ride, you know, I rode along and, you know, I took care of the house and he took care of those things. So, so I'm not sure I can take those over even if I wanted to. So this is a, a, a time where a, lo a lot of people need to rally together. A lot of my work is bringing the strengths of the support system around the person with dementia and figuring out who can take on what and, and not focusing on what the weaknesses are of folks or what they can't do, but more of the strengths of all the people in someone with dementia's life and how they can use those together. Uh, the next one, deciding among loved ones what might not be safe, but is important and valued. This is probably the unique twist again that I pull in, being in a hospital environment. It's often talked about safety. I just, those four bullet points above, those are all safety, right? Driving, medications, medical visits, firearms, I really like to talk about um, the other side of things. Yeah, maybe some things aren't super safe, but is that important to keep living a valued life? So living well with, going back to this living well with dementia. So if it's not a public safety issue, so we're gonna cross driving off because driving does affect other people most of the time, unless you're in a rural area, um, but it's something that's not safe for you. So maybe an example of someone really likes to work out in the garage. They really like to work with tools, um, they, but they know also it's probably not the safest thing. The family's worried something bad could happen. 
well, is it better if dad is out in the garage with the tools and something bad does happen than him to sit in front of the TV all day? And that is not for me as a provider, but for family to all come together and make that decision, right? Um, you know, if mom really likes to hang up decorations and it's really important that she, you know, you know, is part of that physical activity during the holidays, but we all know it's not safe, is it important that she gets to do that versus being sat down and told that everyone else will do it for her? So, so thinking, having families really be intentional about we still have to have quality of life. Um, the last point, loved ones assess the social support and stress management. So this is a part of the disease because there's more happening now with caregivers and loved ones stepping in to look at ourselves as caregivers. If that's the role you're playing, how am I doing? What's my social support? How am I managing my stress? Because this isn't the end. You can see there's a whole next stage here. And this can be a long road to start to start to implement and figure out if that is being managed well and if anything needs to change for ourselves as caregivers. Okay, now we're gonna move into the severe stage of dementia. So the blue arrow is all the way over here. And this is where symptoms of dementia start to impact our ability to do basic daily tasks, such as dressing ourselves, bathing ourselves, toiling ourselves, transferring from a chair to standing, moving our body about, so ambulating. It is really hard to do much at this stage. So I wanna emphasize this again, this stage is really focused to live well. It's now we're really moving into helping the people around the person with dementia, the caregivers, the loved ones, and this idea that there are difficult, problematic, challenging behaviors that can often be viewed, especially in uh, American society, of something to manage or a trait, to move thinking to this is a communication behavior. The person with dementia doesn't have the usual way to communicate because of the disease. We and their, their system are not meeting a need, and we need to figure out how to meet that need to help them. So changing our frame of reference. The first part of this is thinking of the sensory. So living well with dementia at this stage for the person with dementia, we can think about the five different senses and, and how we're addressing those as caregivers and loved ones around them. So the first one, touch. So we know that touch is really important at this stage. It's a sense that we still have left and we can gain a lot of pleasure out of. So tasks like grooming, hand-holding, and massage can really help someone's mood and really help them feel loved and connected. Um, similar, a person's brain at this stage of dementia is very similar to a young child's brain and the size of it and what it can do. And that is a similar thing of what you would do with a young child. They are not a young child, but if we think about their brain and its needs, it's very similar to a young child. Smells are, can still be very satisfying at this stage um, and very much alive. So uh, thinking of fresh cookie scent, fresh laundry, anything from younger in life that would remind them of something positive. Uh, I bet all of us could give an example of when we have, you know, before when you used to go outdoors before COVID, <laughs> where you go somewhere and you would walk in and you'd have some smell and it would just bring you back to a much earlier part in your life. Um, I can speak to that of when I go back to Iowa, there are some houses that smell like my grandma's house did, and it will take me right back to watching Jeopardy with my grandma. So and just a lot of positive emotions. Um, there, I get a lot of questions I have in the past about aromatherapy. It's uh, highly used, used a lot uh, within the community when people are living in their homes, also in nursing homes. However, we haven't been able to study it to show that it has solid data that it is effective in helping mood. Anecdotally, it really does seem to help people. And if not the person with dementia, folks around them that it smells nice. Um, just, we aren't there with the data yet. For taste, dentures are such an important part of this. And if our dentures aren't fitting well, um, they give us any pain that we can lose all pleasure and stop eating. And if we can't communicate well, cause our speech is gone, it can be really hard to figure out why the person's not eating. Um, we know that dentures change and we need fittings as we get older, if we don't have our teeth. So just to be aware that this can be an easy fix 
I shouldn't say easy. This could be something that could be fixable if someone seems in pain and stopped eating because we get so much pleasure from food. And at this stage in dementia, we're going to get pleasure from food that is sweet tasting because we have lost a lot of the other pleasure senses of different types of food. Sight, um, it can often go miss, uh, especially when I worked in nursing homes, but just having our glasses clean so we can see well, making sure we have our glasses because we often forget where they are when we have dementia. Um, to be able to look through old photos, uh, you know, some people talk about making a life story book if you're living in a nursing home or if you've moved to a nursing home at this stage, being able to see friendly faces. And the last piece, hearing. Dementia is a really confusing place to be. You don't know what just happened. You don't know where you are often. You don't know who's around you at this stage. And then if you add in also not being able to hear what care providers are trying to say, this can lead to a lot of frustration and anger. So an easy fix is to put on a hearing amplifying device or a pocket talker or making sure their hearing aids are in and working if they need hearing aids. And then for pleasurable activity, the data shows that we find the most pleasure from music when we were 13 to 15 years old. It's very specific, I know. Um, and maybe you all can recall some music that you, you know, you, when you find those old songs, it hits in a different way than music that's played now on the radio. Um, but that's the type of music that tends to hit for folks with dementia. So then when we do, this stage often comes with some communication. So I'm going to change it from difficult behaviors to some communication challenges. Um, and the, there's, it's nice to put these in two different camps of how we can think about them. So the top orange here, verbally agitated behavior such as yelling or cussing that seem to come out of the blue. Our best guess is this is due to social needs that we're lonely. The person with dementia, we might be in pain or discomfort. And that physically non-aggressive agitated behaviors such as pacing, you know, walking the room back and forth, back and forth, or repetitive movements, moving my hand, doing this a bunch, holding on to my wheelchair wheel. This often comes from boredom. Again, pain is in there or the need for stimulation to do something. So then to alleviate loneliness, um, this, I, I have this slide written two different ways. Uh, one, if of someone, because at this stage you might be residing at home, you may have transitioned to a care facility. So if you're at a care facility, a personal video, home video, audio recording of the people that are important to you in your life, that they can, that a person with dementia, a nurse could just push, that they could hear, can really alleviate loneliness on repeat or I know some people have used those um, greeting cards that you can record in and you just, you know, it's, you open it because a person with dementia can still do that instead of saying happy birthday, a nice saying of I love you, you're safe or, you know, whatever that is. Hi, sweetie. Um, people have different feelings in this next point, a lifelike baby doll. Uh, a lot of programs at this stage use lifelike baby dolls. I've seen a lot of families who say I do not want my mom or dad to have a baby doll. It just doesn't fit well. So that's a family decision, but some people really find that as helpful with dementia. And then more one-on-one -on -one interaction. And this is tough when you're, if, if you're taking care of someone in the home, at this point, you're doing everything, toileting, bathing, dressing, trying to make sure they have enough food to eat, getting their medications, that this part can go amiss. So if that's calling in on people in your support community, um, if they can come, if it's safe during COVID times, um, or, if, you know, neighbors, friends, to be able to provide that video calls with someone across the country if the person with dementia can look at a video screen and stay attuned. So the next part, alleviate boredom. This is really tough and this is where you all or the people who are caring for someone with dementia are the experts and we are not in healthcare. And this is finding something that would match the person's preferences from earlier in life. So for instance, if I was a pharmacist and I had dementia, I might really like sorting candies in a pill sorter. Um, growing up in Iowa, there's a, there's a decent number of nursing homes back where I'm from where they have uh, just the front part of a tractor cab where people with dementia can sit in it and pretend drive. Um, so hopefully wherever the person is residing, there's some opportunity to do something. A lot of people in Colorado like to be outdoors, raking, um, doing stuff in their yard going to the mountains if it's still okay. 
I know those are bigger trips and take a lot of planning though. And the last piece to alleviate discomfort, um, this is more the medical side. If, if it does feel like, man, this might be pain and they can't tell us to make sure that you're getting the proper medical care that they can urinate to see if they're in pain and making sure we're managing pain. So my last piece here is that I wanted to give one program and I have to be careful here as a VA employee that I can't endorse this program because there are a lot of programs, but I, I, I do like how this has been set up for someone at the end of life with dementia. This Namaste Care, and I, I have the link in the handout that you all have. This is a program that is to help build on all those sensory pieces that I talked about of ways to engage someone at the end of life with dementia through touch, through activities in a quiet environment with nice smells in it, and it can be implemented in a nursing home or in someone's home. And it can be a program where people are hired that have been trained in Namaste care to come to the home or nursing home, or the person who came up with this wrote a book and it can be something to read the book and see what a individual family member would like to do. Um, if you're interested in this, go check out the website. Also know there's just a lot of programs like this. So if you ever end up having to look for a place for someone with dementia to live, you could ask them what kind of programs do you institute for end of life dementia care to kind of hear, are they implementing some of the stuff we talked about today? Okay, so I, when I was making this talk that I could go on and on and on about different areas of living well with dementia and I wanted to leave time, which it looks like I succeeded in here, to get some of what you all, I see there's a fair amount of people on the call today, what you wanted when you came to this talk today, what were you hoping I talked about if I have not talked about it? Um, some other things that I was considering is how to help someone live well with hallucinations, the transitions of care, um, or really anything on your mind with living well with dementia. So I'm just open now to field any questions or comments y'all have. Thank you, Dr. Sussman. And if you would like to put those um, questions into the chat room, we'll make sure that Dr. Sussman um, talks about those. So if you do want to talk additionally about hallucinations, transitions of care, or anything else that uh, she's prompted you with, um, please add that to the chat room. And while you're thinking through that, um, Dr. Sussman, why don't we tackle some of these questions that have come into the chat room? They're all excellent. So um, Marsha was asking about just the different types of dementia. It, there are so many different types of dementia, but it, it, we tend to just kind of call everything Alzheimer's. And so, and in her experiences that neurologists tend to do that as well. So how do we make sure that we're getting the right diagnoses, um, certainly from, from our doctor and, and calling it the right thing? Yeah, Marsha, that is such a great point. Um, and I even today just kind of talked about dementia as this whole. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get to your question, but I'm going to give a little bit of information and then get there. So going back to this umbrella term that there's many different types of dementia and there's no cure for any of them right now. There are different indications for some anticholinergic medications. So sometimes that, that it is weeded out. Um, when I talk, there are different indications for medicines that can be helpful in trying to keep our daily functions for the different types of dementia. But often we don't know as providers if this, the most, the three most common types of dementia are Alzheimer's, that's the most common type of dementia occurring, then vascular and Lewy bodies. And depending on the body of literature you read, some will say Lewy bodies is the second most occurring and it's underdiagnosed. And some will say vascular dementia. And then there's frontal temporal and other dementias However, if, we're, if it's a more unique dementia, we're more likely to give that type of diagnosis or look into it more because it is a different path and a different expectation or Parkinson's type dementia. Um, so that is when we tend to get specific, but often I'll see from other providers or myself will say, I'm, I know this person has dementia, they have changes in cognition, their functioning is impaired, and I've met them at a point in this disease, maybe in moderate or even severe, where all the dementias start to look the same. So we just say dementia because the path, to, the path at the end is always the same, that what it looks like. Though earlier, we might work harder to try to find the etiology of what's causing this dementia, especially if it's important to the family. 
um, and for them to understand what's going on. If it's if it seems like this is going, this is clearly Alzheimer's, this is clearly vascular, then it, it's important that I, I agree, Marsha, we should be sharing that. Sometimes we don't know and it won't change the course of recommendations or treatment. So we don't put someone through neuropsychological testing or more testing to find out what type it is because it won't change what we can do. All of the types, it's the same treatment recommendations, which is caregiver education and support and engaging the person in meaningful activities. So that was a long-winded answer. I, would, I will advocate though, that if you are caring for someone or have someone in your life who's been given a dementia and, or neurocognitive disorders diagnosis, at least ask and say, do you know what type this is? Because the person, the provider might actually know and just isn't saying it. So do ask if they know it or if they could um, make some, if they can give you their thinking process. Hopefully that's right. helpful, Marsha. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we have a few questions, so I'm going to kind of lump them together just about um, the resistance around, you know, taking the keys away from people who should no longer be driving and certainly their firearms. And uh, there are a few um, stories in here that people have been graciously willing to share about their experience um, and the resistance they were met with by the family member. Um, are there strategies that the, fa the families can use when having those discussions and what, are they, what do they need to be looking for? Because obviously there's going to be anger. Um, you know, the person is going to be resistant because they don't want to give that up. Yeah, this is where I spend most of my working day is working with families to help coordinate this transition of retirement from driving and firearm retirement. And you already hear my language is important. I'm calling it retirement from driving, not quitting, not um, stopping. And I think that's a first part that this is the time, it's time to move to a new phase because retirement is supposed to be a new phase, right? I'm ending this and starting this. And where, where I work with families is first going back to this reasoning piece. And I'm gonna just pull back that slide because I think it's helpful to think about in this conversation. We get stuck because we want to reason with the person with dementia of all the reasons you missed that stoplight, the doctor said you shouldn't drive, it's not safe anymore, and the person with dementia, which I didn't go into on this slide, and some types of dementia, especially Alzheimer's, does not have insight into their cognitive changes. So you're basically speaking a language they don't understand. So then they get upset, and then there's usually feuds and fighting. So I always offer at least one time, try to reason. See if you can have a, a, a rational conversation. As soon as it doesn't work because of the dementia, it's time to switch paths. And this is the hardest part. Moving from I can no longer reason to now I need to use what we call therapeutic line. Line to our loved one about why they're not driving. So if I'm the spouse and I want my husband to retire from driving because of dementia, instead of saying you missed stoplights, it's not safe, the doctor said you can't drive, so I'm driving, I might say, you know, I have all these Uber coupons and I, we want them or whatever this, he, my husband really likes to win things. Thank you. Yeah. So we won them. We have to use them. So I ordered us an Uber or I've had some spouses say, I want to practice driving because I don't think I've been driving enough. So I'm going to drive or I've been getting sick when you've been driving. So I want to drive. So making it about us. Um, or it might, sometimes it's just easier to get rid of the vehicle if neither person is driving and that can be oh, our granddaughter just turned 16, she needs a vehicle, so we're gonna gift her the vehicle. Um, the car can be in the shop endlessly. Oh, the such and such, the brakes broke, blah, blah, blah. So I can go on and on with therapeutic lies. What I don't know for families is what therapeutic lie. It's therapeutic because it helps our mood and it's a lie, so those are the two words. It's going to hit for the person they're taking care of with dementia. That's where the families know what would make the person with dementia feel good and they buy into because they will never think they are not safe drivers. That will be an argument you'll have until the day they die and it will never be successful. So really switching paths. Same Perfect. with firearms. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, exactly. should I, maybe I'll just touch a little bit on firearms. Firearms yeah. are a little harder and there, there are different things that you can do with firearms. So and that depends on how savvy the people around the person with dementia is with firearms. So if you feel like you're savvy enough to take out the firing pistol, or you know someone who can, that can be a very easy thing where the person with dementia still has that firearm under their pillow or in their bedside, but
but the, everyone around them knows it doesn't work. The only hang up to that is if it got bad enough, if the person with dementia would be someone to step out in their porch and they thought the neighbors stole their golf clubs or something and would point an on a gun that we know doesn't work at someone, they could die by someone shooting them. Mm -hmm. Very unlikely, but I do think it's worth talking about that piece. At a minimum, trying to separate the ammunition, trying to make it so it's harder to get the bullets into the firearm to actually operate it. Um, and different levels, some families decide to gift it to other people that might want it. And I always recommend go through your local firing range or your police station to figure out how to do that safely if you wanna get rid of them. Okay. Terrific. And we actually have a research opportunity on campus that's around dementia and firearms that if we have some time at the end, I'll talk a little bit about with Dr. Emmy Betts. So um, a few people also have asked um, when um, the person is in denial that they have cognitive impairment, but you are a family, friend, caregiver, what strategies can you use with them when point blank, they're looking at you and saying, no, I don't have anything wrong with me. Yeah, this is such a, a common problem that comes up as well. Uh, and, and, I, and I actually, I'm going to start with the word denial, because I think that's where we as people in someone's life with dementia can get stuck. Often we think of denial like an alcoholic's in denial, and if they just understood how much they're drinking and understood how it was affecting their life, they would stop. So if I could impart this amazing knowledge on them, that will change their life. That is true for alcoholism, maybe. I mean, we could, this is not about alcoholism, but that's kind of how we approach that because that's denial. Dementia is not denial. It's a lack of insight. It's not that they don't want to see it or, or, you know, they're saving themselves from it by coping. It's actually this part of the brain helps us have insight into what we're doing and how our brain is working. And that's shut off in a lot of types of dementia. So no matter how much you tell them they have dementia and they're forgetting and they can't do this and this and this, it will never hit and you'll just keep having these conversations basically with yourself and the wall. So I actually would offer to, if you've attempted to tell someone they have dementia and they don't seem to be getting it to just stop and move towards living well with dementia, asking them about their legacy, talk to them about enjoyable things. And then the things that aren't safe in their life, working behind the scenes to make things safer for them. Terrific. Thank you. Audrey has a question regarding some of the, the cognitive tests. Um, there seems to be a little confusion. Um, she's had experience with the Folstein test and the Allen test. Um, and then there was a test done by uh, her, the primary care doctor, all with varying scores. So how do you really know what the level of dementia is when you get these results from different, from different tests? Yeah, Audrey, really uh, astute observation that we have all these, uh, we call them brief tests of cognition in our system. We have a Montreal Cognitive Assessment, short for MOCA. We have a SLUMS, which is St. Louis uh, Instrument of Cognitive Status. I'm not even getting that right. We have the mental, mini mental status Folstein. And what is really awful is all three of those tests are different and they're all out of 30 points. So they can seem very similar, but then as probably your experience has been, you know, 20 on one and 18 on another and 22 on another. So, oh, is my loved one getting better? No, now they're getting worse. Oh, they're about the same. So I, I would actually redirect you to say, don't look at those numbers. When I'm working with folks with dementia, my numbers on that test mean a much, much less than the person their caregiver and what the functioning is. So to go back to this scale. So these three, what stage of dementia, very easy is to think of in three stages. Mild, we have cognitive changes and there's some disruption to everyday tasks. Moderate, the person can no longer do finances, driving, medications. Severe, I can't do my basic needs, bathing, dressing. And not to get caught up in the numbers because those numbers can be affected about how well the person heard with dementia, how well they slept the night before, how much they actually cared about taking the test. So there's so many things that can shift those numbers and they don't actually reflect day to day. Those numbers should just be a signal to say, something's wrong, something's not what it should be here. And then to look into what's happening. So hopefully that takes some relief off. You can just stop taking those tests. <laughs> Stay away from the test. All right. But after um, the diagnosis, stay away yeah, from the test. Exactly. To um, what happens when um, a family member, let's say, can no longer operate their phone or even simple things like the TV remote? 
again, the yeah. strategies of, of people who are around surrounding them, you know, what do they, how do they approach that with the person? Oh, such great questions today. So this phone thing uh, comes up quite a bit because if we're thinking about someone without dementia, we'd say, well, we'll just get them a flip phone, right? And that will be easier because it's just an easier thing. So say that someone had a smartphone and now we're going to switch them to a flip phone. I completely agree with that logic. Here's where it falls apart. Dementia is the inability with most types of dementia to learn new information and to be able to figure something new out. So they actually have the best chance with that phone that they learned before their dementia got worse, when they were over here in this yellow and green stage. So as long as you can make that phone last or get the exact same phone, the better off that person will be, even if it is a smartphone. They will unlikely figure out a new phone. If they've never had a smartphone and you now want them to use Uber and Lyft and you move, that will never work. <laughs> With a TV remote, um, this comes up a lot, especially now during COVID times where we have people with dementia living in assisted living facilities and their loved ones can't go in. And then the person calls and says, I can't get the TV to work, but the loved one cannot go and just figure out what's going on with the TV. So I have offered to folks, tape off everything that's not important on that remote. Only leave the button showing the channel up and down or volume and power. So there's very few buttons and then that will give more opportunity when you're trying, if this is, you know, you're at home and the person's at an assisted living facility that you can try to problem solve with them. Or if you're living with the person to have more opportunity to make it easier for them. Those two often get uh, um, interchanged too. People will carry around a, a telephone like it's a TV remote or vice versa. Cause if you think of those visual spatial changes, boy, does it look the same. Does a landline phone look the same as a remote if you don't look at them very closely? So to know that's just part of the dementia, they're trying their best. If that's starting to happen, if people have a landline and a tele or and a remote and they're flipping them, maybe put like bright blue tape on one and bright orange on the other so you can help them identify it. But that that's a real thing, that stress. I think sometimes I might want to tape off my remote <laughs> trying to figure it out. So <laughs> I think I'm gonna go get the tape. All right. Um, this is a really a sensitive question, and I know many people have dealt with this. Um, so you have a resident who lives in memory care. Um, their spouse lives in independent living, so they're, they're at a community together, but in two different places. Because of COVID, they can't now be together. They can't interact because they're separated. The resident in memory care starts to develop a relationship with someone else in the memory care facility, but clearly is still married to their spouse who's living in independent living. How do, do folks that work at these facilities deal with that, that issue and, and the family as well, having, you know, seeing this happen yeah. before their eyes? Yeah, and, and, and I think this part goes to my part of the talk where I talked about family making a lot of choices as this stuff comes up. So if you're at the facility, and I bet you're already doing this, training to family, and, and sometimes family as they're, now we can talk about denial. If family are in different stages of understanding, mom or dad or spouses or brother or sister's dementia, they might be more or less okay with it. Um, and that, that can be really hard as, the, as a staff, you can see, well, it clearly brings pleasure for this man and woman who are not married to hold hands and they believe they're in a relationship. And it really is not helpful if we remind them that they're married because they don't believe that and that just causes conflict. So they're actually living well in this reality that doesn't fit for these people who are grieving their loved one, right? The family is actively then grieving. I have really lost my parent or my family member if it, or my spouse if, it, if they're holding hands with someone else and not mom or dad or not me. So I, I, I hear how incredibly hard this is on families. And as a facility, as a facility staff, if you don't have the staff there to be able to help them with that grief of someone going through that, if there's any opportunities to be able to give them some resources of places they can go, such as the Alzheimer's Association, or other places, because they really probably need a support group and to, to be able to be okay with that. I would never, on my end, unless family really wants it, recommend to stop that union because it's probably, you know, it usually is hand holding or sitting close. It doesn't usually go more than that. That's another topic when it goes further than that. Um, but really trying to help the family and talk about it as grief. You're losing your parent right? They don't know this isn't their spouse. Okay. And we and just have time. It's three o'clock and I know some of you are going to have to jump off, 
But one last question here, um, because a family member is asking how to address this with their clinician. So um, the family is feeling very frustrated when the clinician is asking their mother who has dementia a question, but not, does not check in with either the daughter or the um, father who's sitting there. Um, how do they address this with the clinician? Yeah. How do they have that conversation, that difficult so, conversation? So, so, to, so depending on your personality style, different ideas here. Um, one is to a lot of people, when you could go in person to write a letter beforehand and hand it to the physician or the provider. So you, because they're what they're trying to do, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. They're trying to do patient centered care, talking to the person with dementia, but yes, missing a lot of the details and probably information they actually need to know of what's going on. So an easy way is to hand them that letter. Um, the other way is to advocate if if you think it's okay and you have that personality say, I have information that might be a little different. So gently say, would you like to hear something that might you might hear a bit differently or offer some physicians, if they have time or providers, I might do a follow-up phone call if I feel like I didn't actually get to hear from the caregiver. Some people you're just not gonna change if it doesn't feel like a fit and you don't feel like the needs are being addressed, the letter doesn't work, you're not advocating, change providers if you have that liberty and insurance company. Like if you have the liberty to change providers and it's not a good fit and you've tried these things and I would change. Um, but on that, I do have a, a veteran and a caregiver I need to see at three o'clock. So I, I know, have to so we up. need to let you go. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, you also have a handout that Dr. Sussman provided and it was on the attached to the email. So that has some terrific resources for you because there were some questions that I think those resources could really help um, that were in the chat room. So with that, thank you everyone and look for your uh, next um, so look for the next session in your email, hopefully within the next couple of weeks that will start around the middle to end of March. And don't forget to also fill out the evaluation for today's presentation. We great, greatly appreciate that. And make sure to tell us um, what type of topics you'd like to hear in the future. So a big thank you to Dr. Sussman and to all of you for attending this webinar series. And we look forward to seeing you in March. Take care, everyone, and have a great day.